it's a, one of the wonderful times when I was thinking of um, all that I was thankful for, this is what I'm thankful for. And when I thought about what to share uh, in this Christmas season, well, I guess this is officially the Christmas season. I mean, uh, Hallmark says that it's been Christmas for about two months now. Uh, the groceries, no, the, all the stores have been saying it's Christmas for about four months now. I mean, uh, Halloween just got bypassed, right? Thanksgiving was just a hiccup along the way. Uh, sell, sell, sell. But, but uh, during this time, I was thinking of, of all the things that I was thankful for. And I was thinking about Paul who wrote this letter to the Romans. He had not ever been there. He knew of Rome. I don't know if he had been there when he was a young kid or not. He came from a, a very wealthy family, uh, well-to-do. He went to uh, Jerusalem as a young um, student to uh, study there in the Jewish synagogue school. Gamaliel was his teacher. He was uh, given very much the opportunity, and he excelled in that. But Rome was the government of the world in that day. Everything passed through Rome. Wherever you went, you saw the imprint and the touch of Rome, whether it was the soldiers, whether it was the taxes, whether it was the, the, the safety of the road. You traveled then really not worrying too much about what would happen to you because Rome was a... Uh, a government that believed in taking care of everyone, if you robbed someone and they found you, you were dead. I mean, they didn't play around. So there was a little bit of um, a peace because Rome wanted it to be that way. Actually, they didn't do it because they were great people. They just did it because they thought it was good for business, so to speak. But because it was the hub of the world, Paul wanted to make an imprint for Jesus Christ there as well. He had done that in the missionaries' journeys. Peter actually shared the gospel with a non-Jew first. But really through Paul's ministry and his missionary journeys, uh, the gospel went places that it would not have gone otherwise. And, and the, the world was literally turned upside down because of the ways of Christ, the power of Christ. Becoming a Christian is like going and getting a heart transplant. You take the old one and you just lay it down and God gives you a fresh, new, forgiven, overflowing with love, with purpose, with that which is genuine, not hypocritical. That which is settling and, and, and is inspiring. That's what we have that for many of us, I pray that we don't take it for granted. It's highly important in our lives, and we need to understand that others who may not have that would desire that, would need that. In our own words, they, we would say they would covet it very much so. And he lived a passionate life incorrectly for all those years. A religious person, but conflicted in his heart. And now that he met Christ, everything was different. He was passionate, yes, but now he was passionate in the most right way unto God. If you would, stand with me, Romans chapter 1, in honor of reading God's Word. Verse number 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. By the way, I say that to you here at New Holland. I praise God for you. Thank the Lord for you, for all that you are, for all that you seek to do, for how you do what you do. You do it well. God bless you. He says that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Somewhere in Rome, a band of Christians had come and lived their life under God, and God had blessed it, and God had grown it. In the midst of chaos in the midst of confusion, truth would reign. And it was a beautiful thing. And everyone all over the world was talking about what God was doing in the capital at Rome. Verse number nine. 
For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I was often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. Part of that time was in chains. I would call that be hindered. That I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Here are these great words. I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, the Jew first, but also for the Greek. For in it, that is the righteousness of God, that is the gospel of God. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Let's pray. Now, Lord, we are so grateful for every day that we have that we wake up knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, is watching over us to take care of us, to love us, to guide us to encourage us, to strengthen us, to empower us, to send us forth with the greatest gift, the gift of your Son, Jesus. I thank you for what you have done for decades, for centuries, for millennials now, for generation after generation, for family after family, for community after community, and nation after nation, the sun rises this day, the Lord's day, and meets Christians that are bowing their hearts and their heads before you all day long. Churches meeting together, missionaries teaching, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. People who maybe awakened in darkness but came to see the light. Thank you that you're still in the saving business. Thank you that you're still in the loving business, that heaven awaits us, eternal bliss with you. And Lord, for us here in this place, we are very grateful. We just came through that season of thanksgiving. But Lord, we're most grateful for you. We know that you have a job and a mission for us as well. So Lord, let us serve you well. Holy Spirit, join us. And may Jesus' name be shouted everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. It says here in verse number 9 that he says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, without ceasing, no matter where he was, there was something that was always on his mind, and that was the ones who did not know Christ yet, or the ones who have met Christ, who were on mission for God, so that the gospel story could be shared everywhere. As a matter of fact, there were two places that he had his unbelievable burden in Romans. Also, it tells us that he had a a, a a great burden for Israel. Matter of fact, he made this statement. He said, if it was possible, I would yield my salvation so that Israel could be saved. That's a massive statement. Honestly, I'm not sure I can make that statement. That I would give up, by the way, you can't do this, but the thought of I would give up my eternal security, my eternal forgiveness, the joy of knowing God and His love and His peace forever and ever and ever, I would yield that so that someone else could have it. Massive gift. 
massive thought, massive heart that made him go forward. Now, let me just secure, you can't do that. You can't give away that which God has already secured. When you gave your heart and life to Christ, he forgave you. You are his, you are his child. He cannot turn his back upon you. Listen to me now, he will not turn his back upon you. Where you go, he's there. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing at all, nothing in all the world. But he loved Israel, but he also loved the group of people out there that had not come to know Christ yet. So every day he awoke, grateful for what God had done for him, but with a passionate desire to see it happen to someone else too. He said, I pray with you without ceasing every day. I'm thinking of you. He did not know them. He did not know their names. He had never seen their faces. He didn't know anything about them, and yet he had a heart's desire. A heart's desire. That's the Holy Spirit's heart's desire. That's the same Holy Spirit that lives within us. That's the same Holy Spirit that wants us to love others as well. That wants the name of Christ to be honored as well. It's the thing that drives us. It's the thing that, that pushes us away from that which is natural, which is selfishness. And makes us selfless, actually makes us Christ like in all of our way. The one who had it all was not selfish, but selfless and left it all and gave of himself that we might receive. And that's the same thing the Holy Spirit does within us. Because we have it all now, we're willing to yield from that, not be selfish, not at all, but to be selfless of our own desires because we have our greatest desire is that someone else, you may not see their face yet, you may not know their name yet, but you know their burdens. You know what it's like to have a, a confusion you know what it's like to, to not have peace? You know what it's like to have a burden because you have failed and you've come up short? And yet, we now have something because we have Christ that makes us want to help them find the same good news that we found. He says here in verse 11, I long to see you. I can't wait to, to, to see you face to face. I can't wait to have that conversation. I can't wait to look in your eyes and hear your story. And then you let me tell you my story. Because his story has become my story. And no matter what your story is, it can become his story too. He said, I long to see you. I, I, I'm looking for you. And he says here, he said, that I may impart to you. It means to pass along, to share with you. He said, there's something you need. Now, when we realize that it cost us nothing, it cost him everything, but it cost us nothing. And when we share or we give or we impart Christ to someone else, it doesn't take away from you. As a matter of fact, what it does is it amplifies the Holy Spirit within you. You don't lose anything. You gain. If you're going to go out and buy someone a gift for Christmas, it's going to cost you. But it doesn't cost you anything, really, to give Christ. He said, he said I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. I have a gift for you. I got thinking about this, Mark. We, 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 we love people, and because we love people during this season, we give. We give a little trinket. We give a little gadget. We give some token of our love. 
But the greatest gift that we could give is the one who tirelessly gives, and that's Jesus Christ. The greatest gift that we could give is the gift that they could never lose. The greatest gift that we could ever give is the gift that compounds joys and blessings forever and ever and ever. The greatest gift that we could ever give is peace and joy, goodwill to men. We've got that ability. Oh, you've got to make up your mind whether you're going to make it. Yeah, you, you, you may go hunting for something to give someone else, but when you have something so wonderful to give, I wonder, y'all listen, how wonderful it would be this year if we would decide to give the best gift to someone. The greatest gift. The gift that keeps on giving. How wonderful it be if this year we we spend as much time and effort and thought into helping someone else receive something that they will be, listen to me now, eternally grateful for. He said, some spiritual gift so that you can become established, so that you can become sound, so that you can have a foundation that is sure and is good. I pray for this. Without ceasing, I pray for this. That is that I may be encouraged, he says in verse 12, together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. I, I, I'm praying and I, I want to see you Christians in Rome benefit, be encouraged as I want to see you Christians here at New Holland be benefited and encouraged. You know what it's like when you share Christ and someone gets to know Jesus? I mean, you get to see the, 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 the burdens are rolled away and the joy comes in. You get to see the smile over the face. And, and how it makes, it's almost as if you get more joy out of it than they do. That saying, it's better to give than to receive, well, I tell you what, to receive Jesus is a great gift. But it's almost as like it's so much more joyful for you to give the gift. And you get blessed by it, but they get blessed by it. It's a mutual growth campaign. Isn't that good? <clears throat> you get something out of it. If it's possible, they even get more out of it. How wonderful that would be. Look what he says in verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. Uh, means with that, I don't want you to, to not understand that, that I often planned to come to you. I wanted to come. I went on the first missionary journey. I got stoned. I mean, literally, that don't mean drugged. I said that once in church. I said, has anybody in here ever been stoned? Guy in the back row went. I went, no, 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 no. I was up here trying my best not to break out, you know. Not the same thing. I'm talking about when they take up a rock and throw it at you, you know. The different. But, he, but th that's how he finished his first trip. And, and I, I think it's crazy. The people that, that took up rocks to kill him and left him for dead, he went back on to love them again. But then he went the second time, and he was going to, to go to this place, and the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 you're not going there. You're going over here. So to be obedient, he had to go to those people, and praise God that he did. Then his third missionary journey, he went to the place and he stayed there in, in Asia Minor where, where those churches were established today. It's modern-day Turkey, and there's not really much of Christianity there at all. But in that day, it was the, Rome may have been the center, but the, the traveling place through was that place in Turkey where you would go through and, and those cities were established there. But after that third missionary journey, he went back to Jerusalem where he was imprisoned. And by the way, eventually did make it to Rome, but in chains. He said, I, I, I planned to come to you. I wanted to, but something got in the way. Church, come on, listen to me real quick. How many times have we planned to share Christ with someone, but something got in the way? How many times we wanted so badly to do it, but opportunity didn't come up? One of two things will happen. You'll just say, well, I tried. And you'll say, no. 
No, Lord, make a way. Lord, please make a way. Well, God made a way. He wanted to make it to Rome. And he was on mission. He was willing to go, even if it meant being shipwrecked along the way and taken in and imprisoned along the way. As a matter of fact, when we get to 1 Corinthians, when we find out there, and he, he, he's from, he is from that terrible place. He said, I want you to know that, that, that what has happened to me being in jail has actually been for the furtherance of the gospel. I may have got here in chains, but I'm telling you, the gospel has gone to places that it would not have gone otherwise. You may have wanted to share Jesus before, but maybe something got in the way. But I'm here to tell you that that doesn't mean that the story's over. You pray and open yourself up and God will give you another chance. God will give you another way. I really wonder right now, if, even now, if we could just make up our minds that this year, this December, this Christmas, we're going to give the gift, the greatest gift, to share the goodness of Jesus Christ is the death on the cross of Calvary, the resurrection, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, the new life that was given. I wonder if we would make up our minds that maybe this is exactly what God has for us this season. He said, I, I may have been hindered, but he said in verse 14, I'm a debtor. I am a debtor. Paul understood where he had come from. And he understood what he had received. And he could not just take this eternal gift of blessings for himself. Because he had been given this great gift, he understood that he was under obligation that others would have the same opportunity that he had as well. What would it say about him to be the recipient of so much blessing? And, and he just said, well, bless God, I've got it. How wonderful it is. How grateful I am. I'm just going to keep it for myself. No, he said, I'm debtor. I am bound by obligation. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that because God has done so much for you, that you have a a, a obligation to share it with someone else. We have heard so much propaganda by Satan, the devil in this world today, and they'll tell you every reason why it is bad and wrong to share Christ. You might offend someone. I guarantee you one second after they die, they would not be offended if they ever accepted Jesus. I guarantee you if they hit hell wide open, eternally separated from the love of God, they would say, well, I deserve this. I, I'm just so grateful that I didn't uh, uh, offend someone who wanted to share Christ with me, or I did offend someone and kept them from sharing Christ with me, I guarantee you, guarantee you, they wanted someone to love them enough to tell them the truth. I mean, their choice is their choice. He said, I am in debt. It's... it's there is something that I owe because of what I've received. Do you feel that way? I believe that most Christians today, if someone came up and they asked you and said, uh, I, I do not know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord, and I really believe that you do know Jesus Christ, would you please share with me how I can know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord? how I can be forgiven and go to heaven one day. I, I truly believe that most Christians would say, absolutely. 
I, I would love to share with you so that you can receive Jesus. The problem is, is they don't know. Or if they do, because they're uncomfortable, they run from it. Didn't you? I did. I did. I tell everybody I was hijacked. Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of me and said, son, you're going to do this or not. I felt like my chest was going to explode. And, and I find that there are people like that, but they're waiting for someone to help them along the way. He said, I'm a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. In that day, they called the Greeks the cultured people. The barbarians were the uncultured. Do you know people today that are what the world would call cultured? Do you know the ones that are Maybe you didn't grow up with the same kind of family. Maybe their parents didn't do the, for them what your parents did for you. Maybe they didn't have the opportunities that you've gotten. Others, they, they've, they're cultured and they're dignified, but folks, they need Jesus too. He said both to the wise and to the unwise. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter that whatsoever. He said... I am indebted to them, whoever it is, everyone. He says, as much as in me is. You know, I, I, I thought about that. and I, That means with everything that I have, I'm not holding anything back whatsoever. As much as I have, I am willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I had a thought about this. I think that a lot of Christians today are kind of like college dropouts. They, they think, hey, this is the greatest idea in the world. I'm going to college. And then they get there, and because of their circumstances or because of cost or because of difficulty or because of all these things, they just drop out along the way. And it, they can still go on. They live a, a great life, and they have a great job and all that. But there, there are certain people that think, Oh, you have to be, you have to have that degree before you can have the job or you can have all these things. But what about those who don't have the degree? And it's like there are some people that are Christians who are saying, I, I hope that one day I can get to the place, but something came up and I kind of fell by the wayside. And, and because I, I I never really, I don't know as much as Preacher Brian or, or Preacher Rick or Preacher Mark or or, or this person, or that. I don't know that much. So I'm just a dropout, and I guess I'll always be a dropout, and I'll never be able to be of any value. Wrong! My grandfather had a second grade education, and he knew Christ, and he wasn't ashamed of it. He was willing to tell anybody and everybody by the way, Bill Gates, wasn't he a college dropout? By the way, I could go on and on and on about people who, for the cause of Christ, didn't have all the things culture-wise or education-wise that this world has that God used in an absolutely wonderful, powerful way. Don't let anybody, anything, any feeling say that you're inadequate to share a testimony of what God has done for you. Just don't. He said, I'm ready. I like the eagerness. I'm ready to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to you who are at Rome. I'm not ashamed. Are you ashamed? Are you ashamed of Jesus? If we took a vote in here, you know what the vote would be? 100%. I am not ashamed. And then when we get out there, there will be something that kind of will be pulling on us and saying, don't, 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 uh, 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 don't, don't, don't talk about that. Can't, you can't talk, you can't mention that to them. Paul had come to a place in time in his life, he said, I am not ashamed because it is the power of God to salvation. It is salvation. It is being rescued. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. It is the joy of all 
the love in the world, all the peace. It is the joy of having, though I have not uncovered all the answers yet, I know the one who has the answers, and he's there to lead me and guide me. Though I have failed a million times, he is there to encourage me on, to say it's okay, get up, let's go again. I love you. How could we be ashamed of something so wonderful? How could we be ashamed of one who had done so much? When I was thinking about this this week, my mind quickly went over to a, a scripture in Mark and a scripture in Luke when Jesus said this. Are you listening? Jesus' words. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and this sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Ashamed? How could you be ashamed of someone you love so much? Really, Jesus is saying, if you're ashamed of me, it's because there's really no love for me. And if there's no love for me, why would you need to be with me or want to be with me? It's not about failure. God forgives the failure. It's about the never trying. It's about looking at someone else and knowing their need. But, I mean, what would we think about Someone who was a doctor and they were there and, and, and someone came in need and you saw them that they were there in need and he knew the answers, but he said, I really don't want to tell them. If I tell them, they might get mad at me. I'll just keep it to myself. What would you ever think of someone like that? And yet, oh preacher, that's not the same thing. Is it not? Is it not? It creeps in, doesn't it? It's the power of God for salvation. When I think about my Lord coming to this earth, living a sinless life, never saying an ill word, but always through looking through the eyes of love, Never judging someone by how much they had or that they didn't have. Never judging someone by being born into the best of families or to the worst of families. But finding value in everyone and being willing to sacrifice for everyone. Misunderstood? That was okay. Judged? He was all right with that too. Yet he stayed on mission. The cause was so important. The need was so great. Though he prayed, by the way, prayed for me and for you. Though the pressure was so intense upon him that sweat came through his brow, the corpuscles of blood opened up and blood flowed through. And yet, he gave of his body to be broken for us. He willingly shed the precious redeeming blood that cleanses. Whether you realize it or not, it cleanses. It's always cleansing. When you have those evil thoughts that become sin entrenched in your life, the blood is there to cleanse. When your tongue is unleashed and, and vile things come out, the blood is there to cleanse. When your heart has a shadow of doubt that comes over it, the blood is there to cleanse. When you're weak and you can't go forward, when you have no strength and you don't know what to do, the body that was broken for us is there to heal Forevermore. Forevermore. Breathing the 
breath of glory forevermore. Smiling in the presence of friends and family from Christians from Abel forward forevermore. Joy unspeakable forevermore. Glory to the highest forevermore. The crescendo of praise when you don't think that you could get any better. It still gets better forevermore. Forevermore. God revealing, pulling back the curtains that we can see more of his preciousness forevermore. Yes, it's the gift that keeps on giving. 